Welcome to the Backyard Professor Chess videos where we have fun on a Saturday morning learning about chess. I mean, what better way to spend the Saturday morning than learning about chess, right? And who better to show us chess than Bobby Fischer, right? However, Bobby Fischer plays a lot of really powerful opponents during his career. And he is completely dominating. And that's the issue that made Bobby Fischer so fascinating. He always went for the win. That's the one thing chess probably needs a little bit more of today on the really super high level. All of us amateurs want to win, but none of us can very much. I'm speaking for myself, of course. Although I did have a couple of good wins this week, but I've had some really tough losses. You know, you go up and down and up and down. That's the essence of discovering how to improve your chess. Study the Grandmaster games like I love to do and try to emulate them and put their ideas into practice. Who better to teach us than Bobby Fischer, who plays white? He is playing Bent Larson, who is playing the black pieces. This is an interzonal tournament in 1970, and Larson gives the Sicilian defense. Let's jump right into the action and see what is going on. Surprise! Bobby Fischer opens with the king pawn. <laughs> yeah, whatever. No surprise at all, right? <laughs> and Larson comes out swinging. He ducks and gives him an uppercut with the C5. You know, I could put this in terms of boxing, right? <laughs> and this is a battle. This is a sweet battle. At this point in his career, up into this interzonal tournament, Larson has defeated all of the tough competition to get here. He is riding a wave of pure power. I get this particular game in the analysis of Larson. There are some excellent collection of games in of, of Larson in Gary Kasparov's outstanding book, My Great Predecessors, Volume 4 on Bobby Fischer, he, he describes some of Fischer's contemporaries. Larson was one such. At this point in 1970, Larson was steam rolling ahead. He was really solid. And then he met Bobby the Youth Fisher. This kid just had something about him that was magical, yeah? Yeah. D4 right in the center, and Larson says, yep. We'll do the Sicilian exchange. Not a problem. Knight will take the D4. And now the knight to F6, but of course hitting the E4 pawn and knight c3, but of course supporting the e4 pawn, and now knight c6, but of course solid center, which is basically the idea of most openings, of a lot of openings. This one is no exception. Compact, small, he's not possessing any of the core central squares, but Larson's opening is as solid as Fisher's here. Fisher bumps his bishop back to b3. He wants to keep the diagonal. Larson's going to want to castle. Everybody against Fisher should castle early. Even though he's dead, he'll still trounce you in this life playing as a ghost if you don't castle early. You must castle early against Bobby Fisher and Larson takes my advice and castles. Oh my goodness. Now Bobby does something interesting here. This, this is not 
his usual. He's he's attempting to uh, what break it up. He, he's he's attempting to do a different uh, line because he recognizes Larson is moving very very fast. Larson, as Kasproff said in his comments, uh, he is he is playing a prepared variation and he's he's taking no time at all to make these moves so Fisher is going to kind of take him out of the prepared variation this is this is not the typical way Fisher plays and in fact six months after this Fisher went back to his typical way of playing against Larson which I will explain in just a moment after we see what happens, he castles Queenside. And that was the, uh, six months later when he met Larson again, he castled Kingside. So we have castle on opposite sides, and this heralds the pawn storm style of attack. Yeah. Uh, Fisher is going to push his Kingside pawns like crazy. Larson is going to push his queenside pawns like crazy and may the fastest pawn win because you must storm the kingside. The, the ideal, remember, with the pawn storm is you want to pro press those pawns but have the peace supports if at all possible. But from here on out, you really can't afford to dawdle. You really got to hot foot it, you know. Put the pedal to the metal, baby. Squeal the tires. And vroom! Yeah, baby! Let's get going! Go get the king is the theme. So, Larson recognizes this. And he prepares. He begins to prepare his pieces to be against Bobby's king. Which makes perfect sense because... Bobby is going to start flicking out his kingside pawns against Fisher's king, or, or I mean uh, Larson's king, and Larson had better pay attention. And he does. The surprise, and this is more of a psychology against Fisher at this point, Larson does something just a little bit different. And as magnificent as these guys' minds were, they recognize when there is something amiss or different or an attempt at surprising them, but this one did cause quite a stir. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that happened with Bobby Fisher, but the crowd was, oh, interesting. Unprovoked, Larson begins to put his knight on the c5 square. He didn't even wait for Fisher's pawns to arrive. He is reassembling his units, which can be a huge advantage, but it's like a double-edged sword. It can also just cut you in half and wipe you out. So we'll see if Larson knew what he was doing. Fisher. So, truly, you can see, as far as the pawns go, Fisher is ahead uh, because Larson is readjusting his pieces at this point. So the pawn storm at this point belongs to Fisher. And he is motating. He is flat out hustling. Here we go. Here it comes. Here it comes. Now that Larson has reassigned his knight to c5, he does the proper strategy. And this is so tough for us beginners and amateurs to... Uh, it's just, you gotta drill it in your head. This is a race against time. You can't afford to try to stop his pawns. But his pawns are gonna wreck my kingside safety. Correct. You can't afford 
to take the time to fight his pawns. You must begin your own pawn storm against your opponent's king. And that's the difficulty for us. Uh, you know, you get a little bit nervous. Here they come. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I got, I got, whoa, whoa, whoa. I got to do something to halt this. That's your instinct kicking in. That's what we have to train ourselves to change. Because that's wrong. And I know it takes some nerves. Chess is a game of nerves. But that would be wrong to begin reacting. This is entirely correct. You get your own attack going. As best you can, you ignore your opponent. And here, Fisher does something quite rare. He makes a mistake. Yeah. He pushes F3. A complete waste of time. So, this kind of piques our interest. We go, wait, what? That's a waste of time? That's a waste of time. But you're defending a central pawn. You're not paying attention. That's a waste of time. That had to happen. Or that is even better. That had to happen. He's already put the thrust into this. Go, man, go, Bob. Go, man, go, kiddo. But he didn't. You're not playing defense. And you say this. You say, well, okay, but wait a minute, dude. You're contradicting several of your earlier videos. You're contradicting the received chess wisdom from the antique ages. Because... He is working in the center, responding to a wing attack, and that is the proper procedure, correct? Yes, absolutely, 100%, and you'd still be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute, are you telling me chess is a whole bunch of contradictory conceptions conceived without any rhyme or reason? No. I'm saying every game has its context. The context here is the foot race into the attack, not the defense of a center pawn. No kidding. And I know you and I, you know, we. We're just, you know, we're not adept enough to, I'm not adept enough, a lot of you guys are, but I'm not adept enough to realize this is an error. Uh, I thought it was a good move when he made it, but Kasparov really castigated him. So, what does Larson do? He responds likewise. He develops a piece into the center, and you say, so... See, that wasn't so bad. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, in that case, what do we got? Here comes Fisher. Note, notice, is what I said. You're going to throw the pawns up against the king, have the pieces backing them. I mean the queen and the rook back in the H and G pawns. We're talking pristine perfect here. That is what you want. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Did I say yeah? I meant yes, yes. Absolutely. Great. Okay, here comes Fisher. <sighs> Larson, because Fisher, and it's just one move. You go, you know, 
Is it proper to punish a guy for just one mere move waste of time on the Bobby Fisher Bent Larson level? Heavens, yes! Punish him! Get to the attack first! And you just might win. Larson achieves his objective before Fisher did. That's a pretty important point at this game, at, the, at this point in this game. Well, Fisher gives support to the center. Now, now, and I know there was some question and discussion of this in the notes. Um, better how Fisher played it here. Uh, the Knight A4 did not accomplish what Fisher would have wanted, so the Knight to E2 is better, giving support for his other Knight. So here we go. Fisher is beginning to react to Larson, and now Larson continues his attack. Notice Larson got there first, taking the bishop, putting the king in check. So he breaks up Bobby Fisher's queenside fortress before Fisher arrives at his. And in this kind of a game, that's the objective. So Larson's doing pretty doggone good at this point. You notice neither one of these guys are getting blown out in the middle at all. There's truly, honestly, no weaknesses there uh, in the center at all. Larson did get to crack the king side first. Let's see how Fisher builds a defense when this occurs. This is one of the interesting parts of this game here. Here comes Larson. Notice he doesn't slow down. He is just still coming at Fisher. This is the proper way. Don't worry about any of that. That's not any threat. You're the threat. You are the threat. You now have weaknesses on this side. Go get them. You are threatening. Keep going. You don't need to switch all of a sudden to defense and worry about stopping Fisher from pressing that pawn. No, keep going on your attack. And again, this is the hardest thing psychologically that we have to uh, learn to be able to steal our nerves and just do it, man. Well, we might lose a piece. Correct. You might have to sacrifice two more pieces and have the lost piece in order to get to the king to win the game. But that's what we have to gear ourselves up to be able to do. And this is part of the reason why we're the beginners and these guys are the pros. Because they've learned how to do that. So this is great to watch how they do this. I love how this works. So, Larson came up and now... And you say, see though, now he's going to ruin Larson's king side, which is probably true. However, and it's true that he does impact the pawn cover. It does give Larson a partial open file, however. So that's not such a disaster. But Fisher, notice he didn't come over here. Fisher kept pressing his attack. Notice Larson hasn't worried about this over here just yet. He finally did respond to it, but he has continued his attack. That's the important part of this game. And now here comes Bobby. You notice again he is trying to stay persistent in the attack. Okay? No passive moves. Let's get this going. Let's do this. 
now. Bent Larson, really one of the super greats, hits Bobby right square on the nose. Bobby's wing attack provokes a response of an attack and development in the center, which is the correct way to respond to that. Yeah. And now, Bobby must respond. Notice there is a piece gone now from each side. And yet, both of their centers have remained intact. This is pretty heads up chess. This is quite delightful to see. And notice also that they have both gotten to their opponent's king side and are putting pressure on both of the king sides. Yeah? Now for one of the most brutal surprises of the game that rattled Fisher. And he knew it too. <laughs> and you go, it's just a pawn push. Yes, it is. It's just a pawn push that just stops White's offensive. There's nothing forcing Larson to take that H-pawn. Nothing whatsoever. You notice what that does is it takes out the rook of Fisher on the H-file. Yeah, it stops Fisher's offensive. That move is superb by Larson. Very interesting. Now Fisher knows he's in for the game of his life and that particular pawn move got two exclamation points. That's how good that move was. Bishop takes g5. Bishop takes g5 check. And queen takes g5. And you say, well, wait a minute. It appears that Fisher has more power now on the king side coming in than he just recently did. Yes, it does appear that way. Let's keep watching. Larson puts on a spectacular offense and then a couple moves later defense. And then he does an offensive move. And then he does a defensive move. And his mitts back and forth is beautiful. He does it just precisely correct with his timing. What helps him achieve this is that he does have pressure against Fisher's kingside. Believe it or not. Because he took the time to make sure these pawns were forward it makes all the difference. Let's keep watching. This is really interesting how this works. Fisher will keep his queen in the game. Yes. Now this is one of Bent Larson's best, what they call a prophylactic move. It is a waiting move. Let's wait and see. It has... Uh, the potential to be extremely powerful offensively. It also has the very, very solid defensive aspect to it. It's a prophylactic move. Nimzovich was huge on this kind of movement in a chess game. Wait and see. Larson doesn't attack anything. Larson doesn't defend anything. He's just simply making a quiet move prophylactically that really has a sting to it. Very interesting. So Fisher has to put his rook on the G file instead of 
his other rook. Fisher is forced to move his h rook instead of this. Had Larson just taken the h5, this could have been Fisher's setup, and they both knew it. This would have been far, far better, and, and the pawn wouldn't have been there of Fisher. It would have been a black pawn, and, and White would have had an absolutely dominating attack. As it is, Fisher now has this, which is clearly inferior it's not bad. I'm not saying it's. I'm not saying it's horrible. I'm just saying compared to what he could have had, had Larson taken that H pawn instead of pressing his G, that's why his G pawn move got two exclamation points because it eliminated the pristine ideal setup for an attack. He does have a setup for some offense, but. It gave Larson time to come up with a good, good rock-solid defense without going on the defense. There's the big deal. There's the big deal right there. So, <laughs> Larson now can proceed on with his attack. You see what I mean? The prophylactic move, the move that gives you a, a, a defense and an offense at the same time, and now, right back on the other side of the board, right back to the offensive attack, creating further weaknesses. I, I mean, Larson is doing this really, really well. Fisher's getting gray hairs in this game, is what I'm trying to tell you. This is, this is really something else. B takes A4. And again, now his timing is so excellent because now he hits the center, which is forcing Fisher to react to Larson. Therefore, Larson has the initiative, right? So, knight e6. Fisher is forced to sacrifice a piece here. That's how powerful Larson's playing. Something very, very rare in a Bobby Fisher game is being forced to lose a piece. Queen c4 gets the exclamation point. He's hitting e6. Here's where Fisher loses a piece. Because if he's not careful, he's going to lose the game. So he's virtually forced to do this. And the queen will take. And now Fisher goes down a piece. So this is getting quite serious. He might be in a little bit of trouble if he's not super duper careful. But it is Bobby Fisher. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Take the central pawn. Notice where Fisher... Okay, he just... Psychologically, see, you're down a piece now. But... He still hits in the center. He still takes the pawn in the center. And he does have the open file. So he still has a basis for an offensive... And his king is not too terribly exposed after all, so the attack of Larson wasn't that devastating. But notice Fisher is still doing everything correct. This is really interesting to watch this. Watch how Fisher handles this. It's very instructive. Rookie eight, here comes Larson. And now, out of the gate, here comes Larson. Fisher comes over to Rook B6. Yeah, I could do this like a boxing match, right? Tuck and weave, duck and roll, punch and clobber. Yeah, yeah. Here comes Larson. Blam. Taking the pawn. Notice how Fisher has played his rooks so well. 
that he also takes a pawn. Yeah, this is great chess, you guys. I'm just so not kidding. Rook c8 directly across from the king. Larson's right on it. Yeah. King b2. Yeah. Get out of the potential pin for sure. And now look at Larson go. A double directional attack against the weak. Against the weak. Backward pawn. Uh, with the bishop hitting up into here. Take a breath, Bobby. Take a breath. Oh, my. Rook c1. He's still got... So, you can see uh, at one moment Larson's playing defense, and then he comes back to offense. And then uh, at another moment, Fisher is playing offense, and now all of a sudden he's doing defense. It's kind of a yin-yang thing. It's really fascinating to watch how well these guys are doing this. This is so fun. Hitting the weakness, of course, pushing the pawn. It is a passed pawn, and there's nobody more dangerous with passed pawns than Bobby Fischer. So is this game over? Oh, gracious, no. Let's keep watching. Yeah, yeah, let's keep watching. Rook a8. I mean, right? <laughs> it's a passed pawn, man. Seriously, you've got to hit it. It's a pass pawn. You've got to hit it. Look, Fisher has nothing but three pass pawns. The comment is that those are still not enough compensation for being a piece down because they are not far enough advanced. So, Bobby's squirming, but he is squirming. Bishop will take the h5, and, and now notice how every time Larson has a way to take a piece, Fisher also will take a pawn. Or I meant Larson take a pawn, Fisher take a pawn. Larson will try to take a pawn. Fisher will try to take a pawn. This is really important because Bobby's behind material. He must keep trading as he can. And now Larson comes blam, Bishop e2. Tough position for Fisher. He brings his rook back to c5. And here comes Larson with his pass pawn. Yeah, now Fisher has passed pawns. But there's not enough compensation yet for his piece being got, being down a piece because they're not as advanced as Bobby wishes they were. That's for sure. There's no question about that. However, he is able to say, okay, here we go. I'm going to push my pawn also. And now Larson is going to put the kibosh on this pretty quick. But remember, the king is a fighting piece also, and Fisher's putting his king into this. Larson's king is way back over here, but he's got the compensation with the bishop, the extra piece. Two rooks and a bishop versus two rooks and a king. So, yes, Larson isn't using his king, and Bobby has to, but Larson's not in trouble because of that, and he will proceed to push the h4. No question. King comes to d3. And rook will go to e2, establishing that line that the king cannot proceed to attack him with. Yeah, he's going to put the stop on that right now, right here, right now. So, this is really important. Fisher will bring his rook over to try to get rid of that cotton-picking bishop. But now Larson in the open file can put check to the king. Yikes. Fisher has to come back. And now the bishop dodges out of the attack, centralizing, keeping in contact with weak points in Bobby's position. 
Yikes. So the king will come up to b4. And now the rook again on a partial open file can make sure he's keeping Bobby's king in check. Yeah, so the king will come to a3, finally out of danger, but realistically out of the picture at this point. So Bobby is truly out or down a piece. And here comes Larson's past pawn, which is further advanced than any of Fisher's. But Fisher is going to continue pushing the past pawn. Is it a race of past pawns? It can be. But why not attack the weakness in your opponent's position? Ouch. Yeah, that backward pawn. Man, <laughs> that hurts. So Bobby's going to attempt to keep the grouping together and escort those two pawns up and in all together at the same time. Larson goes check. So not only does he catch Bobby on the file, he catches him on the rank as well. And now his king must come to b2. You don't want to go to a2. That doesn't threaten anything. Your king is a fighting unit, so put him up against the bishop. Truly. That's the correct move. And now bishop simply bumps back to d3. Centralization. He's in Fisher's territory. Bobby rooks belong behind past pawns. He's following the basic principles to push those pawns in if he, if he can at all. And now bishop a6, Larson ends the past pawn pushing. Blockade completely stymies him. We can really see the power of a bishop in an open board here, can't we? That, that, is, uh, that is tough. That's a tough move. Rook comes to c6 to threaten the bishop. And now again, eliminating yet another weakness in Bobby's position, hitting the king, going check. Uh, it's an overwhelming attack at this point. Bobby should resign. Bishop comes to b7, tickling the rook again. The rook comes to c3. He's hoping to alleviate some pressure by getting rid of some pieces. Larson will have none of it. He simply goes rook to e2, check. Yikes. King to d1. And now the rook to g2. And this is where Bobby resigned. Larson beat Bobby with an exchange of offensive and then a balance of defensive and then a balance of offensive and then a balance of defensive he had one step ahead of Bobby I want you to notice that he was just the, and that edge can be so thin but it was the waste of time F3 pawn push that made the difference so that's quite a lesson for us. And then the principle of you attack, attack, attack. Once you start that roller, you never stop and slow down. You just go through with it. Larson got to the attack first, and this game demonstrated the influence and the power of that nerves of steel. You can't just willy-nilly try to stop your opponent. Go for it on your own side. So great lessons for this. Thanks for watching Backyard Professor Chess videos. If you like it, hit the like button and subscribe. Give me some comments in the comment sections. And be good, do well, have fun, be happy, and remember, I will see you again in the next Backyard Professor Chess video.